All right, good morning, and thank you for joining our overview of the governor's January budget proposal for 24-25. Yesterday, we heard the description of the budget uh, uh, as vanilla, and we, I thought that was an interesting choice of words, right? On the one hand, vanilla can be, you know, un unexciting, uh, sort of simple flavor, and on the other, it's the world's most popular flavor. And so you were really in that context, uh, that plus adding the fact that the governor uh, has not seen a deficit budget situation in his term. 30% of our legislature is new. I'm really interested in hearing from our experts how all of these play together and, and whether we've got vanilla or some spice coming our way. So. I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Scheel and uh, for introductions, thank you again for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy to be here. My name is Mark Scheel. I'm the Deputy Superintendent and Chief Business Official for St. Clair Unified School District. We are a district of about 14,000 students. And I'm also the current Vice Chair of the Casbah Legislative Committee. Kim? Uh, Kim Bardenega. I'm the Administrative Assistant and CBO for Dunsmore Joint Union High School District and on the CASBO Legislative Committee, a Legislative Committee member. Uh, we're a Northern California necessary small school, uh, frontier school, and we have an ADA of about 64. Uh, been here a long time. Don't consider myself an expert, but thank you for that <laughs> comment. I think the longer I'm here, the less I know, but um, glad to be here. And I'm Elizabeth Esquivel, the Assist Assistant Executive Director of Government Relations for CASBO. Thank you for being here with us this morning. So we'll go ahead and just kick it off and go um, and talk about a little bit, um, before we talk about Proposition 98, I really just wanted to make sure that everyone um, had an understanding that during uh, the governor's press conference, he reminded us uh, of the investments that he wants to continue to keep his promise on, the key investments and core programs that have um, been developed over the last couple of years, roughly about $29 billion that he was referencing, and that includes a learning recovery, learning loss mitigation, community schools, special education, educator workforce, children, youth, and behavioral health. And so these are all really important things that both the legislature and the governor have taken the time to invest in. Um, so he made that pretty clear that he wants to continue to keep his promise um, and, and move those programs along, even when we're experiencing some budget shortfalls. And as we talk about the fiscal landscape in general, uh, we the proposal forecasts a balanced budget of $291.5 billion, which will be sent to the legislature and the general fund for this year is about $208.7 billion. The proposed budget acknowledges a $37.9 billion shortfall, which is roughly about $30 billion less than what was projected by the Legislative Analyst Office back in December during their fiscal outlook. Uh, as you can probably see that this is a really, really big difference we had a $68 billion projected uh, deficit from the LEO. And here comes the governor on January 10th saying, no, it's actually not that bad. It's about $37.9 billion. And though, although the uh, closing the shortfall may bring a challenge, the 2023 Budget Act set aside just under $38 billion in reserves, which the budget proposes to withdraw from. So I think a common, something common that we're hearing is that we are not in the same position that we were back in 2008. In 2008, we did not have those reserves. And Governor Brown decided that, hey, I don't want the state to be in this situation again, so let's create some funds and some reserves accounts so that if we find ourselves in a situation, we can tap into these. And then here we are, finally being put in a position where we are tapping into these reserves. So again, we are seeing this deficit coming to the state. However, we're not in the same position given the, re the reserves that we have now versus what we didn't have back in 2008. And so how is the state looking to try to address this shortfall? The budget incorporates the following balance combination of measures to close close the shortfall in this budget year. So we're looking at the state withdrawing about $13.1 billion in reserves. 
$8.5 billion in reductions. And I just, I do wanna note that none of these reductions are from Proposition 98. So we are not seeing that there. Uh, $5.7 billion in revenue and internal borrowing, $5.1 billion in delays, $3.4 billion in fund shifts, and also $2.1 billion in deferrals. And I do want to note that that is something that was experienced back in the recession. The school districts were experiencing cash deferrals. And although we're not seeing that on the Proposition 98 side, we are seeing deferrals taking place in the higher education side um, with the University of California and the California State University. They're going to be experiencing about $500 million in deferrals. Um, so I think we um, we are seeing that this is the, the avenue that the state is taking to help address those shortfalls that are taking place on the general fund side. And I think it would be important to add here that uh, this is on the non-Prop 98 side. There are no deferrals in the governor's pr proposal on the Prop 98 side. There are no uh, cash deferrals. There's no mid-year funding cuts. So uh, these are specifically on the non-Prop 98 side. And thank you for a question that was just asked on here about the presentation um, slides. We will be providing a copy of the presentation slides after the webinar, so sometime later today. Um, this is also being recorded and it will be uploaded. We will also um, be taking questions as we move through the PowerPoint presentation. We'll be monitoring the chat, so feel free to um, ask questions along the way. So thank you for, for that question. I think I just wanted to point out that our concern is the huge gap between the LAO's projection and the governor's projection. In the past, there's always been a difference. There's always been, well, if we do this or do that, but this is such a huge difference. Um, I have concerns of, of being able to pull that together and where that's going to come from. Um, I do want to say I'm really happy the fact the governor is prioritizing education that is a good thing. So some of these budget tricks of delays and deferrals and reductions and shifts are being outside the Prop 98. But I do have a concern how to move forward when there is such a big gap between the two projections. Yeah, thank you, Kim. And I think you bring up a good point. Um, for those that may not be as familiar, the Legislative Analyst Office, also known as the LAO, they are the, the right hand of the legislature. So here we have the legislature's right hand, their fiscal individuals saying, we, we're seeing a $68 billion deficit. And then we have the administration on the other hand saying, no, it's not that much. It's only about $38 billion. And so at some point in time during these budget deliberations and conversations this spring, they're going to have to sort out what that difference is going to be, because that that is like you're right, Kim, a really, really big gap. And so that has to be addressed at some point in time during these conversations and during these budget negotiations. And, and to me, I'm curious, how is that going to impact um, both you and Kim at the local level and how you're trying to project what your budgets are going to be as you plan for them? I think that's a. I think that's a really good question. And, you know, when we heard $68 billion budget shortfall back in November, many of us started immediately starting to think about how are we going to solve this problem? What's this going to mean for Prop 98 funding in 24-25? So as Tasha said, you know, yesterday the governor said this is vanilla um, and then there, there's not a lot of excitement here. And so from in, in some respects, we are happy that the budget wasn't nearly as bad as what many of us thought it was going to be. On the flip side, me personally, I think it contains some risk. What if the this the governor's proposal of only a 38 billion, and I say only, only a 38 billion dollar problem being much closer to 68 billion, or what if it's 50 billion? Um, how are those problems going to be resolved? Because if that is the re, if that is a revenue shortfall, and approximately 39% of that being impacted to Prop 98. What is what is that next shoe that's going to potentially drop and how will those uh, potential problems be resolved? Well, I agree because when you're trying to project out a budget 
and you're so far off. Sorry, my light goes off when I'm not moving. <laughs> but uh, it, it's hard to project out. And you have people on one side saying, well, don't worry about it. They'll find the money. So we just move forward as, as planned. And then all of a sudden the shoe does drop and then you're stuck. So you have to kind of try to figure out where those cuts might be coming because we don't know at all. And so it's a six month period of time while they're negotiating that we're not quite sure what's happening while negotiations are going on, while we're passing the May, you know, March 15th deadline for layoffs, while some things are happening, we're really concerned about what really could be the cuts. But I will say we have some good news. And that good news is there are additional reserves available that have not been tapped into yet. So if something were to happen, there is something else that the governor has to be able to fall back on. And those are the reserves um, that haven't been tapped on. And I know that we'll be talking about those a little bit later as well. Um, so that is uh, maybe a little bit of a silver lining. And I think it also shows, I mean, for for years, we've been talking about as CBOs of our school districts, the importance of having those reserves. So when you do have budget shortfalls, you have something to rely upon. And uh, we have no better example right now as to the importance of those reserves than uh, the the reserves that are available at the statewide level to help us within Prop 98 and solve this budget shortfall as well. We do have a question on here. Um that asks, do we know the reason why there's such a large difference between the LEOs and the governor's budget deficit projection? And what we were told was that it's very high level that the, the projections were just different. Um, we understand that the administration never considered the guarantee, uh, specifically to Proposition 98 also, considered the guarantee to be a problem or a solution, and, and the guarantee is what it is. So as they said, um, they have different projections, but also understand that there are different opportunities to withdraw from certain reserve accounts. Um, and as mentioned on here, fund shifts, delays um, in order to be able to address. But I, like I mentioned, at some point in time, um, those, those dollars and those differences will be needed to sort out, will be needed to sort out. Um, we also have another question on here, if we have a breakout of what the difference of is in the 30 billion. Um, I don't think we do at this time. Um, we're hoping to see um, the revenues and the facts and figures come out from the Department of Finance soon. And hopefully that will give us a better sense of um, where that comes from. All right. And so then um, moving on to just Proposition 98 itself, uh, the budget proposes a funding level of $109.1 billion. The guarantee continues to be in test one for all years 2022-23 through 24-25 and is rebenched from 38.6% to 39.5%. So it's easy to see that there is an increase in the guarantee, but I think uh, the key word is understanding that we are being rebenched based on universal transition and transitional kindergarten. And to a certain extent, um, the summary also references Proposition 28, um, which is uh, something that we'll have to look into a little bit further, considering that Proposition 28 should be coming from the general fund. So I think that there's gonna need to be some clarification on that. The budget includes a total funding of 100. $26.8 billion, 76.4 coming from the general fund and roughly 50 billion from other funds for all K through 12 education programs. And the, nine, the Proposition 98 per pupil funding is roughly 17,600 and 23,500 when accounting for all funding sources. And here's just a, a chart from the governor's budget, seeing where we're at now compared to where we were back in 2013-14. We referenced the 2013-14 because that is when the local control funding formula began and getting a sense of where we have gotten to where we were back when LCFF began. I think Mark, you, um, you mentioned something interesting earlier on this slide. 
I did. I uh, my my comment on the slide that was a little bit of a takeaway. You know, it's it's obvious over the last several years we've seen tremendous revenue growth throughout the state. Um, and as a result of that, we saw Prop 98 revenues peaking in that 21-22 year at $110.5 billion. And with this shortfall, we see that a uh, significant drop to 22-23 down to $98 billion. And even with the governor's proposal, um, the $109.1 billion does not get us back to where we were in the Prop 98 funding at the 21-22 fiscal year. So... That means that there has been a significant amount of inflationary costs and other and other cost pressures that have not been able to be borne by the Prop 98 as the result of that significant decline in funding over that three-year period of time uh, based upon the current projections. Right. That was my concern on the it's it's great to see the it going back up, but the inflation rate between 21-22 and 24-25 is tremendous. So it's not meeting actual costs. And I, I pointed this out to quite a few people the other day that our normal power bill, for, for us it sounds little because we're a little school, but maybe $1,500 a month is now $5,000 a month. And last month it was $7,000. So just in a brief period of time, just the power bill alone is skyrocketing, let alone all the other costs. So talking about uh, tapping into the reserves, we have Proposition 98, the rainy day fund, and this the budget reflects a revised 22, 23, and 23, 24 payments and a 24, 25 payment of roughly 340 million, 288 million, and 752 million into the rainy day fund account, and withdrawals of roughly 3 billion for 23, 24, and 2.7 billion for 24, 25. So for a total revised account balance of more than 3.8 billion at the end of 24-25. So the budget also reduces the current year rainy day fund balance to 5.7 billion and, and that continues to trigger the statutory 10% school district reserve cap. Um, I, I, just, I just wanted to point out, um, I've always been the 10% district reserve cap has always been a a thorn in our side as far as being able to set aside money for what we may need in the future. And um, I know it's all calculated in a in a bill out there, but it just seems funny that we're we're putting money into the reserve account just to pull it back out again, just so we can keep the statutory 10% school district reserve cap. And that's what I see in this little piece here. But... And transition, thank you, Kim. I'm transitioning over to the local control funding formula. Going into this, um, we are now hearing that we have a cost of living adjustment of 0.76%, resulting in a decrease of about $1.4 billion. And I think um, really the, the interesting part here is that last year, last year's COLA was, uh, last year, the COLA for this upcoming budget year was estimated to be about 3.94%. And as we got closer to understanding what the tax, uh, tax was going to end up being, the LEO estimated the COLA to be 1.26%. And so that, that in itself is quite of a big difference. So now hearing 1.26% in the fall to about 1% 1, 1 during their fiscal outlook in December, and now seeing the governor's budget proposal being at 0.76%, that, that's quite a big difference. And so for, for school districts who are trying to budget in the out years, going from 3.94% just a year ago to 0.76%, um, I, I just, um, it, it, it is a big difference. And so there's gonna be you know some adjustments that will need to be made if um, they haven't already moved in that direction. The budget also proposes to withdraw about 2.8 billion from the 
rainy day fund account to support ongoing LCSF costs for 23-24. As we can remember, we had an 8.22% COLA and that was very high. And so we uh, had to figure out ways to be able to try to fund that COLA. 2.2 billion in 24-25 and using available reappropriation and reversion funding totaling 38.6 million for 24-25. Um, we do appreciate that the governor continues to apply that same cost of living adjustment to all the categoricals outside of the LCFF. And we know that includes special education, school nutrition, even the LCFF equity multiplier. So if you remember the budget of 2023, there was $300 million ongoing specifically for this LCFF equity multiplier. And so when you add that 0.76 cost of living adjustment, they'll be receiving about 302 million. And I think, uh, Elizabeth, what you said there in regards to the 0.76% COLA, uh, that is part of the solution to this. The fact that the, the COLA is less um, helps solve the budget problem within Prop 98 as well, because less uh, increase was needed uh, within the local control funding formula because 0.76% costs just less than the, the original 1.2 or even the nearly 4% uh, COLA. So I think that that is helpful. I think on the flip side, though, it goes back to what we talked about before. And um, inflation is much greater than 0.76%. Uh, in, in fact, we saw just recently one of the public utilities just requested a 13% increase to the CPU C CPU. Um, you see for next year. So um, there is a big gap there. And this um, is going to cause um, some trouble for many school districts uh, where you have declining enrollment and only a uh, increase of 0.76% on the COLA as opposed to uh, what we've seen in some prior years. And there are a couple of questions I'm hearing, I'm seeing on, the, um, on here about what the projected COLA is going to be. For 25, 26, and 26, 27, we don't have that just yet. We know that the Department of Finance is working with FIGMAT to um, figure out what these projections are going to be in the out year. So we're hoping to see that in the next couple of weeks. So thank you for those questions. Okay. On facilities, you know, facilities has uh, really been a big topic of interest to the legislature. Um, we have seen a handful of facility bills be introduced over um, this past year, uh, specifically related to um, how to address heat surfaces at, at school sites. Um, we also understand that there's a need, there's a continued need for um, building and modernize, uh, modernization for facilities. So we need those facility dollars and we're drawing down on the funding that we currently have right now. And if you, if you um, are not familiar, we do have AB 247 by Assemblymember Murutsuchi. That is a TK through uh, 14 community college bond that is roughly about $13 billion. It would go on the November ballot. There's also SB 28 by Senator Glazier. His is about um, $15.5 billion, but incorporates higher education. And only $9 billion of that would go towards TK, um, or actually would go towards kindergarten through community college. So there's a big discrepancy um, between the two um, bills. And the conversations are taking place right now within the two authors, because essentially, if they want to see something on the November ballot, they're going to have to collaborate and figure out two things. The first being, what is the number gonna be? They have two different numbers right now. They're gonna have to figure out, come together on one, one number. And the second piece is, are you gonna incorporate higher education or not? And what was interesting with the governor's press conference is that he acknowledged in the previous bond, unfortunately, um, that took, or not the previous bond, the previous proposition that took place happened to be Proposition 13 and it ended up failing, but there was a reference to Proposition 13 incorporating higher education and then understanding that that didn't end up um, moving forward. So um, we'll, there's, there's gonna just be continued conversations 
taking place this spring and, and we'll hopefully find out um, sooner rather than later a compromise between the two authors. Elizabeth, I would just add, we need to make sure that that proposition when it goes to the ballot is not Proposition 13 again. I agree. I don't, I don't know who we need to talk to on that one. <laughs> And so there's two things that we see under facilities in this proposed budget. On the school facilities program, we do see a decrease of, um, of investments that were planned from 875 million to 375 million. Again, these are, these are general fund dollars. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we also see from the California Preschool Transitional Kindergarten and Full Day Kindergarten Facilities Grant Program, uh, again, in 2023, the Budget Act included a plan. And I say plan, and I want to emphasize that because it's not necessarily in statute. When we see plan, when we see intent language, we also have we have to be very cautious about whether or not that funding will, will end up being there the following year. So I think that that's... Um, those key words that the you know, legislature or the administration use as like, hey, it's up in the air. Um, we want to do this, but we don't know whether or not we're gonna have the funding for it. So we do see that plan $550 million being delayed another year to 25, being delayed to, to 25, 26. And again, these two programs are from general fund dollars and given the shortfall that we're seeing right now, we understand that on the general fund side, they are being hit much harder than Proposition 98. So this is an opportunity for that administration to help level out, provide a little bit of relief on the general fund side. I think that there's also an opportunity to delay the facilities funding so that we understand, because there's an understanding that there's a dire need for additional facilities funding. So hopefully kind of putting that pressure and putting that fire to say, we need additional facilities money. We need to make sure we get a November uh, ballot, a, a, a bond on the November ballot. And I think here, this, this was an obvious, this was an obvious delay. It was an obvious area where the governor could um, use this delay to help solve the shortfall. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit of sour news because uh, there is no change in the implementation of the TK. Um, and so we're still going to have more students being enrolled into TK. Uh, that helps offset our declining enrollment. So that is good news. But um, many districts are struggling with accommodating those additional students because they don't have the facilities in place. And so uh, this delay in funding is going to cause a burden to those districts because uh, not being able to access those dollars um, as easily, there may be still be some options for them, but um, may not be as easy for them to access it if uh, the money is not going to be available until 25, 26. And I think part of this facilities too, for me, uh, I was, I, I have to be honest and say I was a little shocked and surprised at the very beginning to hear the governor express his support again for another facilities bond. And he did express that the administration expects to negotiate with the legislature this spring to discuss you know, what these proposals are gonna, you know, how these proposals are gonna be considered. So not only are we talking about um, the assembly member and, and the Senator having conversations about what that's gonna look like, but the governor during the press conference inserted himself to say that administration expects to negotiate with the legislature so that we can get something on the November ballot. And something else we are seeing on the governor's proposed budget is instructional continuity. So there continues to be um, of interest to making sure that we are, or that the state is doing what they can to continue addressing learning loss mitigation, learning recovery, attendance. Um, you know, we, we know that students are still being out sick, um, wildfires are taking place. And in order to help address attendance and instructional challenges, the budget is proposing some statutory changes. They, they want to allow LEAs to attend 
to add attendance recovery time to the attendance data. So attendance recovery can take the form of Saturday school, intersessional school, or before and after school as an example. It would require LEAs to provide students with access to remote instruction or support to enroll at a neighboring LEA for emergencies lasting five, five days or more. Um, I think an example of this is like there's a wildfire that's taking place and the student needs to relocate somewhere else while allowing them to do remote instruction or if they can, you know, enroll at a neighboring school if they have to be away from their home for more than five days. And it encourages LEAs to provide hybrid or remote learning opportunities to students unable to attend school. Well, I'm really happy to see some of this being addressed. Um, We've always pushed for this because we do have a pretty good uh, remote instruction situ situation in place now because of snow and weather conditions and things that are going on. Uh, my biggest concern is funding. Uh, when we're a necessary small school, we're in a band of funding. So unless, unless ADA recovery takes us in or out of one of those bands, we would need additional funding for Saturday school or any of the additional um, attendance recovery systems that might be taking place outside of the regular school day. Right now, we're, we do concurrent, so our students are actually online while the teacher is teaching the class. So there's no additional cost, but if we were to try and do attendance recovery ADA recovery outside of the regular day, we would need additional funding unless for some reason it took us in and out of one of those funding bands. And so I think there, as long as there's some additional funding that might go along with this, or especially for necessary small schools, um, I have some concerns. And I also, <laughs> I've said this before, lasting five days or more, um, you, you kind of leaving out the emergency that might only be three days or the emergency that might only be a snow day that we're closed for one day and then we're back in school. Or there's some, some real details in this that I, I really hope we can, when they say devil in the details, I think this has some really good positive things to look at, but I'm really concerned about how it gets implemented. And I think, uh, Mark, you had mentioned something, um, a concern that you had as well in terms of um, the requirement to provide students with access to remote instruction. Yeah, I mean, just more of the concern. And, and it, I think it goes back to Kim's comment in regards to the devils in the details. And I think that this is a great opportunity. It shows some outside the box thinking. I wonder um, some of the details. How do you make some of these happen for some of our um, neediest populations. Um, how would this also work in our special education community? Um, maybe some of these, maybe these neighboring districts don't have some of the uh, capacity to be able to provide the service needed for some of these students that really need it as well. So I, I think it goes back to Kim's comment. Uh, what's the devil in the details? And we'll have to wait and see what else uh, comes out as uh, in the coming months. Yeah, and I think um, when our, during our briefing with the Department of Finances, like you said, they're, they're really trying to think outside of the box here with not much money available, um, but they don't have a, a fiscal impact or a fiscal cost to this yet, but they are hoping to um, help offset you know, some of these student absences, uh, like I mentioned earlier, mitigating the learning loss um, and helping address the chronic absenteeism. Uh, but at this point in time, there isn't a fiscal estimate or fiscal um, impact for this yet. All right. And another thing that we're seeing in the budget is a teacher pre preparation and professional development. And so we are seeing um, a couple of investments here uh, using Proposition 98, funding $25 million ongoing through the K-12 mandate block grant to support training educators to screen students in K-2 through second grade for reading difficulties, including dyslexia. So if you recall in the, in the 2023 budget, 
the governor signed a bill to require LEAs to screen students for these reading difficulties. And so what we're seeing here this year is $25 million of funding to help train educators on how to actually do the screening. So that doesn't take place, I believe, until 2025, 20, until the 2025, 2026 school year. We also see a $20 million one-time investment for a county office of education to work with other entities for math coaching. So essentially what they wanna do is get these math teachers and math coaches and be able to have them train other teachers on math in anticipation of a new 2025 um, framework that was recently adopted by the State Board of Education. So how do we get these math leaders and math coaches to help train other math teachers so that we can help them be prepared for when this new framework comes to place? Another part of, um, of this proposal is that there are statutory changes proposed to include focusing the use of unexpended, allocated, learning recovery emergency block grant funds to address the needs of students most impacted by learning loss based on an assessment of needs and incorporated into the existing LCAP development process. And it also is gonna clarify that the allowable uses of the funds include professional development aligned with the new math framework so that staff um, can have the tools to recognize and offer mental health support students uh, as well. So uh, I, I don't know, um, you know, how many districts out there still have unexpended uh, learning recovery block grant funds, but I think um, both Mark and Kim, do, did you have any that are left? And no, no, and and after thinking about this for a little bit too, are they are are they proposing to pull all the unexpected allocated learning recovery emergency? see block grants from all the districts and then reallocate it back out uh, that or is it only only those districts that have unexpended allocated money can use it for this and so i i if we don't have any unexpended how is this going to be funded that was my concern because we don't have any Yeah. And I think your question too is, is the, the unknown, how many districts still have funding left out of this as well? And it'll be on a case by case basis. Certainly it'll be a benefit to those districts to allow them uh, this flexibility to use the funding in this way. Um, but it may not be a flexibility that will be available to all districts if they've already spent all the funds. Right. Or have it allocated or ha already have plans on how to spend it. Um, I did see a question that came in in regards to possible reductions in some of the one-time funding that's already been allocated, and uh, that should have also been in one of my no comments earlier. Uh, there is no proposed uh, clawing back of uh, one-time funding that has already been allocated uh, based upon what we saw yesterday. And I, I think... Um... The, well, we're, we still have a lot more to learn about um, what this means of the unexpended allocated funds uh, and how that you know ties back into the LCAP. Um, I think one of the questions is going to be, well, how is this going to be used? Um, is this going to end up being restricted? And the big question, I think, for, for the legislature and for the administration is going to be how many school districts still have an expended funds and how, how much of how much does that come out to? But there there is um, a little bit of concern on whether these unexpended funds will begin to uh, be restricted. But we won't know until we see a little bit more language. And uh, just going very briefly over the California State Preschool Program for those that may have them. A uh, couple of um, things to note here. Uh, reimbursement rate increases previously supported by available one-time fund, federal stimulus funding. Um, 
The budget includes $53.7 million in general fund. These resources are in addition to the roughly $140 million in general fund and $206 million in Proposition 98 general fund identified in the 23 Budget Act. And these amounts reflect an identified one-time savings of 102.1 million general fund and 446 million Proposition 98 general fund. Um, they don't. Uh, the administration doesn't necessarily see this as uh, an actual um, reduction because they're trying to help reduce the shortfall, but rather because of just the number of students that they're seeing. So they're just feeling like it's a natural reduction. Two other things to know um, that were in the budget this year is on ERAF, the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund. So ERAF uh, began in 1992 and charter schools were also established in 1992. However, charter schools uh, were not specifically stated um, and addressed within the existing ERAF distribution statutes. And so the budget does try to clarify that charter schools are eligible to receive ERAP now. And when it comes to career education, um, this is uh, somewhat in alignment with the executive order that he came out with towards, um, I think the middle or uh, the fall of last year when it comes to the master plan for uh, career education. And the budget directs the Commission on Teacher Credentialing to create a new elementary arts and music education authorization for career technical education teachers. <laughs> so um, I think that there's a, a big interest in using the term arts and music. I see that as a response to Proposition 28, uh, a clear connection to that. Other, um, others, to other things to continue um, on here when it comes to significant adjustments to programs outside the LCFS. So we do see a decrease for county offices of education and that just has to do with ADA. Um, zero emission school buses. We do recall about two years ago seeing $1.5 billion in Proposition 98 funding being allocated for zero emission school buses. Last year, we saw a billion dollars of that being delayed to 24-25 and 25-26. And so the budget this time expresses that they're maintaining the one-time $500 million. However, it's unclear what's being done with the $1 billion at this moment in time. Um, because they're silent on the $1 billion, at least in the budget right now that we're seeing, uh, It'll be interesting to find out whether the delay will move to the 25-26 year or whether there's any other plans for that $1 billion. And again, that, this was $1.5 billion in Proposition 98. So that's definitely um, a question to consider as we talk about $1 billion in Proposition 98 funding. Uh, there's also a new curriculum embedded performance task force for science, 7 million. Um, they are going to continue to invest in the cradle to career data system by providing $5 million ongoing. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the COLA is being applied to programs outside the LCFF. And so we're seeing 122.2 million ongoing for the Universal Meals program. So we continue to see their committed investment for that program. Um, broadband infrastructure grants, five million one time. Uh, the K through twelve high speed network, three point two. There's also uh, a park access, so they're going to have a county office of education try to come up with the program for fourth graders to have park access. That's two point one million ongoing. Inclusive college technical assistance center, another two, and then one point five million dollars ongoing for the existing homeless education technical assistance centers. I think the one thing on that slide that's really stands out to me is the commitment to the universal meals program. We've heard up and down the state, the positive impact that this has had on providing more meals to students all throughout the state and seeing that continued uh, support for that program. And not only the support for the program, but continuing to plan for 100% funding of the program, I think is really key. 
um, as many districts have already put uh, procedures in place and infrastructure in place to continue to uh, support that program. So uh, that additional funding is really key and will help ensure many districts that uh, their nutrition services funds won't become a won't require a general fund contribution. And so I think that that's a really key point. So just some of the big takeaways here, um, as Mark had mentioned earlier, we're not seeing cash deferrals, no mid-year funding cuts like we saw last year with the discretionary block grants, no program rollbacks or changes, no additional block grant clawbacks, no state buy-down towards the school employer contribution for CalPERS and CalSTRS. So although we're going to continue to see an increase with CalPERS, there isn't um, anything in this year's budget to help. Um, with that pension buy down, we are seeing a contribution at the state level. So the state is by, uh, using funds to help pay down some of that unfunded liability, but that's for the state contribution, not the school employer contribution rate. And then we also, again, um, have that 0.76% COLA um, that I, I know Mark and Kim were just and I'll continue to share, not let them share um, how that's just some, um, it's even though it may be a cost savings to the state, it's just not going to cover what the cost of living adjustment is going to be. It's not going to cover the electricity rates that we're seeing increases in for PG&E um, and you know, pension. And I'll let Kim and, and Mark talk a little bit more about that. Well, I think the one of the things that was in there was, um, as of right now, no projected increase in the CalSTRS employer contributions. So that's good. Um, we are anticipated, and based upon the last information we've had from CalPERS, seeing a pretty significant increase in the employer contribution uh, to CalPERS. And we'll have to see what their investment returns are to see if maybe that will um, be softened a little bit. Um, but that's, again, as I said earlier, that the, the, the really small COLA that we're seeing is not going to be able to uh, be used to offset some of these other cost pressures that we're seeing, uh, especially from like the employer contribution for CalPERS. And that assumes a district is not declining enrollment. When we know that many of our districts are declining enrollment, that 0.76% COLA isn't even going to keep a district flat uh, with declining enrollment factored into it. So for many districts, this is going to result in a actual funding decline or um, for their entire general fund. But again, a better situation than many of us were anticipating uh, when we were thinking about a $68 billion shortfall, and now we're only thinking about a $38 billion shortfall. Only. Only. And I have to, you know, go back to, I'm, I'm glad to see that there's a, the prioritizing education. I think that's vital that that stays on the top of the list. Um, I do like the um, first four bullets there. My concern still goes back to what's going to happen in the next six months when we really come down to real dollars. Will those actually come to fruition or will we have to actually face some of those? Um, I agree that it would not be nice to get some help on the Cal, um, CalPERS rates that are skyrocketing and especially for small school districts. And I know all school districts, but that they're becoming huge issues. Uh, the 7.76% COLA, and I saw in one of the chats earlier, it really is almost a negative COLA when you consider the cost of living increases that are out there. Um, I know there's, there's talk about uh, possibly reversing some of the mandated uh, minimum wage uh, to help with this but most of us have already adopted new salary schedules to incorporate new minimum wages to try and, and meet the challenges of the fast food restaurants to where our, our employees need to be making at least what they are at McDonald's, if not more. And so I think there's just, I, I'm kind of the nickname of half, you know, glass half empty person. And I guess that just goes along with my job but I do have to have somewhat of a cynical and negative viewpoint on some of this. So I am concerned, but 
like I said, it's much better than what we were looking at a couple months ago. And the high priority on education is fantastic. So those are good points. And before we continue to move over, um, I did see a question on here, and I know um, there was kind of some some questions around whether um, charter schools, if charter schools receive ERAP, will that reduce the district's allocation? You know, um, Mark, we were talking about that a little bit. Yeah, we're we're going to need to do some. I believe I know the answer to that question, but I need to go dive into it a little bit more. So um, uh, we'll have to get back to them on the answer to that question. I did want to answer one of the other questions that came in, and that was in regards to any possibility of moving a, moving away from this um, restricted funding environment that we're currently in and um, away from what is perceived to be a movement towards categorical funding. And to answer that question, I will say this is something that comes up uh, frequently within the legislative committee, um, something that we're very mindful of and conversations that we've had um, and almost every meeting that I've been a part of in the legislative committee is ensuring that uh, as much of the resources as possible are um, are uh, flexible in their use and trying to stay away from the categorical nature uh, and not a return to categoricals. Yeah, there's also another question around um, any funding for textbook adoption. Any talk about that at this point? I haven't heard of any talk about funding for this. Um, I can't imagine that there will be, um, but it's something that we can definitely uh, bring up to see if there is any thoughts to whether funding will be provided for these purposes. You know, if Eric Dill were here, he would probably say um, that somebody will point out the robust funding that we receive through lottery funding and that <laughs> being available uh, for the textbook adoption. So, um, Yes. Thank you. Um, so moving uh, towards the end here on what's next, and please feel free to um, continue to have some questions on, uh, add questions that you have on here so that we can try our best to answer them before, before we wrap up. Um, but under what's next, um, really what was interesting is again part of the governor's press conference and even part of his um, summary is talking about chaptered legislation and so he is balancing his plan um, to defer consideration of resources requested associated with recent chaptered legislation to the may revision so essentially the way that i kind of see this is yes i signed some pieces of legislation I don't know if there's gonna be enough funding for it at this point in time. So let's go ahead and pull those um, chaptered pieces of legislation back. Let's revisit how much it's gonna cost. Let's look at how much funding we have and let's talk about whether or not we reduce that funding, whether do we delay that funding? How are we gonna address um, these pieces of legislation? And that, that, that to me is something that I haven't seen um, before, at least during my time, um, and, and being very explicit about saying, I signed legislation, I don't know if there's going to be enough money. Let's go ahead and revisit this. And one example that he provided during the press conference was to, um, either it was 2 million or 22 million, something very small um, for fruit to address fruit flies. And so he said, that's up in the air. But a really big one that he specifically provides in his summary is S SB 525 by Senator Caballero, which increases the minimum wage uh, to $25 an hour incrementally for health care workers. And that would begin June 1st of 2024. And so the administration is seeking early action in January by the legislature to add an annual trigger to make the minimum wage increases subject to general fund availability. And so it's interesting to kind of go back and say, oh, okay, um, I signed this piece of legislation, but wait, let's go ahead and make it contingent upon a budget appropriation is essentially what he's saying here. Um, and that that's a way to try to be more fiscally responsible. Um, he's not saying that he wants to take it back, but let's let's talk about this being subject to general fund availability. and. We don't know how many pieces of legislation are going to be up 
for negotiation, but to be able to hear that directly um, during the press conference and seeing that example on here, I think uh, he's he's being very serious about whether or not there's going to be enough funds for the legislation he signed. Um, the other big thing, too, is, uh, again, uh, we don't know a lot of details when it comes to some of these new programs, and we'll find out additional information in trailer bill language. It's called TBL. We refer to it as TBL. And so additional details will be released in the weeks to come. So we'll go ahead. We will um, be looking at these trailer bill language. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, read them, summarize them, and provide a news break on what these look like. Um, some additional details that we'll, we will learn from this proposed budget. And I think with that, that is um, our last slide that comes, um, we are at the end of our presentation, but wanted to just go ahead and revisit some of these questions in the, in the chat um, and see if we have any of them. And it, from what, so we have a, a comment on here. From what I saw, it was an increase in revenue in the budget year and small savings from the state offices. We have um, something on here that it looks like the governor is only accounting for the deficit already exists in the last two years and not projecting any deficit in the 24-25 budget year. Um, there's one on here on how will this impact community colleges? Is it similar or does not address? Um, I'm not sure if, um, what what the specifics of the reference to the community colleges. So if that person is still on here, I would be interested in knowing what piece um, they were referring to. That would be helpful. Is there any recognition at the state level that the minimum wage increases in other industries will have a continued negative impact on the growing classified worker shortage? For example, the fast food increase in this budget. I know we were talking about that a little bit, Kim. Do you have any thoughts? Well, I agree. Um, <laughs> we we joke around here when some of our, our, our people are coming in going, oh, wow, you think we might be able to make more than, you know, the people working in the fast food industry. And we're, so that's why I said earlier that most of us have already tried to incorporate all these minimum wage increases in our salary schedules to try and keep our classified employees well paid as opposed to the fast food industry. Um, it's becoming a challenge and I understand their frustration as well. And yes, we do when we're, you know, when we talk about our negotiations, we do incorporate all the the increased costs in for health and welfare and and say, well, you know, really, you might only be making twenty five dollars an hour, but it's costing this much because you're getting your health and welfare package, you're getting your PERS, you're getting this and that. So we do make that well known. But when it's a paycheck coming home every day or every month to a classified employee, those costs are not always necessarily seen because they're trying to make ends meet. So it is, it is a concern. Thank you for sharing that, Kim. We also have an answer to, um, or the comment regarding the ERAP for charter schools and that the charter property tax transfer will be on the minds of all districts around the edge of basic aid. With the low COLA, we will see many districts flip next year and the charter property tax transfer will hit them hard in 2025, 2026. So thank you for providing that, Eric. Um, the and maybe this is a great question for both of you, Kim and Mark. Between minimum wage and time increases, um, HW increases, it's becoming increasingly difficult to continue to hire retained staff. Now we are also competing with fast food workers since they can pay more than some of our districts. Does the state have any plan to address these issues? And I guess uh, before I turn it over to Mark or Kim for any comments, um, at this point in time, I. I don't know. Um, uh, we 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 have seen the discretionary block grants from last year, so I think that that was kind of like here's a free for all money. Go ahead and cover all your problems, and we know that that's not going to be enough. Um, but as part of Casbo's budget priorities, understanding that there's not going to be enough funding to ask for additional funds, um, we did provide 
some information to the administration and the legislature to let them know here are our budget considerations and concerns, here are our constraints. So at least on CASGO's perspective, we are putting our budget considerations forward to let them know here are all the increases that we're experiencing and the cost constraints that we have. I don't know, Kim, Mark, you have anything to add on that one? Yeah. I don't know. Go ahead, Mark. I was just gonna say, I don't know that I have much else to add. Um, we, I think it's obviously going to be something on their mind. Um, the, yes, all of those cost increases are continuing to go up. Um, and I, I know we at legislative committee will be talking about how the coal is not going to be enough to absorb many of those pressures. And so how can we start easing the burden on our school districts in a lot of different ways? And I know that that's something that we in CASBO are also looking at is how can we support some initiatives that maybe um, ease burdens in other areas uh, to provide some flexibility and other opportunities for the school districts as well. And I don't, I just want to say that, you know, being in education for as many years as I've been in, I feel blessed to have, have had the opportunity to be in education for all these years. And I think in looking at our staff and our students, they're wonderful. We keep asking our staff to do more and more, and they keep doing more and more, and they keep succeeding because it's coming from the heart. And I think that's important to recognize that they're doing that. The problem does become a paycheck at the end of the month, too. So we have to really be mindful of what we're we're doing because we are trying to serve our students and our community and put forth as best that we can. And I it, it just comes from the heart when, <laughs> when you're trying to do the best job you can. Over the years, they keep asking more and more, and we keep doing and keep succeeding. I I think it's 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 been a real experience and wonderful people to deal with. Well, we are on the hour here, and I just want to thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us. And thank you so much for the great questions, the great discussion. Um, we look forward to hosting a couple more webinars and keeping you in the loop on next steps, trailer bill language, May revision, budget considerations, and all of that fun stuff that comes. Thank you all. Oh.